Today I'm going to be discussing my master's research, uh, looking at the effect of parity and stage of gestation on whole body and maternal growth and feed efficiency of gestating sows. Feed intake and gestation is typically based on the sow's body condition or her body weight, her parity, as well as stage of gestation. There have been many models used to develop, um, or models developed based on each of these criteria to determine gestating sow nutrient requirements. Each of these factors has been studied throughout the years, but research conducted in commercial environments is limited, as well as the application of these models within a commercial environment. Current research specifically pertaining to whole body and maternal growth and feed efficiency of sows raising greater than 13 pigs per litter is also lacking. So the objective of this study was to determine the effect of parity and stage of gestation on whole body and maternal growth and feed efficiency of sows housed in a commercial farm and fed via electronic sow feeders, commonly referred to as ESFs. There were a total of 712 females, 249 gilts, and 463 sows from a commercial sow farm used in this study. These females were group housed and individually fed with ESFs. There were three research pens in the gestation barn. Each pen held about 260 females. There were six electronic feeding stations per pen, so that's about 45 females or so per station. The females were group housed in dynamic groups from day 5 to 112 of gestation. And what's unique is that this farm, there was also a scale located in the alleyway following the feeding station, returning to the pen. So this shows, um, this is just one individual pen in the gestation barn showing the entrance to the electronic sow feeders. And so there's six feeders lined up here. What happens is, assuming that there is not, um, the, the feeding station is not occupied by another sow, the gates are open. And so the sow will then walk into the feeding station. And once she's in there, there's an RFID, um, she has an ear tag, the RFID tag in her ear. And then that's read by the antenna within the feeding station right there at the feeder. So it then starts to read her ID, um, identifies that sow, and then starts to dispense feed. So it drops about 150 grams per minute. So as long as she stays in that feeding station, it will continue to dispense feed until she's either she leaves the station or she's done consuming her daily allowance of feed, which is set by the producer. So as she leaves the feeding station, then she walks through an alleyway and she walks across this scale. And so that's when we're able to obtain a daily body weight on these individual sows as she re then returns into the pen. So as I mentioned, we have feed intake values as well as body weight values for every day of gestation for these sows. They were enrolled in the study on day five, and then at day 112, they were then moved in, into the farrowing house for subsequent lactation. Back fat measurements were obtained on day five as well as day 112. They were fed a, a common diet with, formulated to contain 0.63% SID lysine, according to parity and body condition. Gilts from this farm received two kilograms per day. Ideal sows or ideal body condition sows received 2.3 kilograms per day. And skinny sows received 3 kilograms per day. There were only 12 skinny sows in this study. And it was conducted over a 149-day period, beginning in early May and concluding in mid-October of 2015. Average daily feed intake, body weight, average daily gain, and feed efficiency were all generated daily for these sows. Energy requirements were predicted using a series of equations to model nutrient utilization in gestating sows. The energy requirements were divided into tissue pools for maintenance, maternal growth, which was partitioned into maternal lipid and, and fat deposition, and then we have products of conceptus. The data was divided into three parity groups, a parity one sow, which is a gilt, parity two, and parity three plus sows. Gestation was also divided into three periods, day five to 39, day 40 to 74, and day 75 to 109 of gestation. Growth and estimated response variables were analyzed using the Glimix procedure of SAS, whereby the linear predictor included parity group, period of gestation, and all interactions as fixed effects, as well as the random effects of period nested within individual sow. Back fat and reproductive performance were analyzed similarly, whereby the linear predictor included parity group as the fixed effect and the individual sow, again, as the random effect. Degrees of freedom were estimated using the Kenward Rogers approach, and pairwise comparisons were conducted on such means using either a Tukey or a Bonferroni adjustment. Results in this study were considered significant at a p-value of less than 0.05 and marginally significant at a p-value between 0.05 and 0.1. These are the diets that were fed in this study. 
Um, it's a common corn soybean meal diet formulated to contain 0.63% SID lysine, 18.5% crude protein, uh, 3,225 kcals per kilo um, ME, 0.83% calcium, and 0.59% phosphorus. So as you can imagine, there was a great deal of data generated from this study. So first I'm just going to talk about the descriptive statistics before I get into some of the other response variables. So initial back fat in this study, the average was 16.1 millimeters. Final back fat was 16.6 millimeters. Total intake for each sow throughout the course of gestation on average was 228.5 kilograms. Initial body weight average was 165 kilos. Final back fat, or I'm sorry, final body weight was 222 kilograms. And the average body weight gain for these sows was 56.8 kilograms. The average parity was 2.3 with a range of 1 to 5. My average total born was 14.9 with a range of 1 to 25 piglets. Average born alive was 14.2 with a range of 1 to 23. The average pigs weaned was 13.3, and the average gestation length was 115 days. Okay, moving into the response variables, here I have average daily feed intake on the y-axis in kilograms, and I have day of gestation on the x-axis. Parity 1 sows are represented by the blue, parity 2 in the red, and parity 3 plus in the green. So recall, parity 1 sows and this feeding system, um, or this sow farm, they receive 2 kilograms of feed a day, and parity 2 and 3 plus sows receive 2.3 kilos per day. So that's attributed to the differences we're seeing here between parity 1 and parity 2 and 3 plus sows. What's interesting is if we look from day 5 to 39, um, excuse me, for parity 2 sows, they actually consume more feed I'm sorry, less, more feed in comparison to parity 3 plus sows during that day 5 to 39 of gestation. However, if we watch parity 3 plus sows, they actually increase their amount of intake as they move from day 39 to 74 of gestation. If we look into this a little bit more, so here I'm showing feed intake throughout the course of gestation for parity 1 sows specifically. So again, on the y-axis, I have intake in kilograms and day of gestation again on the x. And there's 26,560 observations here. So each dot represents the intake for one sow for that specific day of gestation. And what we notice is, remember, these sows receive two kilograms a day. Um, there's a lot of variability in intake with those sows within those first five to seven days or so as they enter into that pen. Um, and we see a lot of variability, again, throughout the entire course of gestation with sows not consuming their full amount of feed. If we look at parity two sows, again, um, same setup as before, these sows should be receiving the 2.3 kilograms per day. And although there is an improvement in comparison to parity 1 sows, there are still a lot of sows that are not consuming their full amount of feed within those first few days or so in the pen. And especially throughout the course of gestation, there are a lot of sows that are only eating 2 kilograms per day. In parity 3 plus sows, again, we see an improvement in comparison to gilts like what we saw in the beginning, but there are still some sows within those first few days in the pen that are not consuming their full amount of feed, as well as throughout the, uh, the course of gestation with sows not consuming their full amount of feed. And remember, there are some sows that were set at the skinny strategy. Um, for parity 3 plus sows, there's nine sows that are eating this three kilograms per day. Moving on to body weight here in kilograms on the y-axis. So we see that parity 1 sows starting body weight's 156 kilograms and ending body weight's about 202 kilograms. So they're gaining about 46 kilos in body weight throughout the course of gestation. Parity 2 sows starting body weight about 166, and they end about 198 kilograms. So they're gaining about uh, 32 kilograms in body weight. And if we look at Parity 3 Plus, they have the greatest body weight throughout the course of gestation, starting at about 190 and ending at 224, gaining similar to Parity 2 sows about 33 kilograms of body weight. Average daily gain here on the y-axis. Um, we see that parity 1 and 2 sows follow a similar pattern throughout gestation where they do increase in average daily gain from day 5 to 74 of gestation, thereafter decreasing during that final period of gestation. But what's interesting here is parity 3 plus sows actually increase average daily gain in each subsequent period of gestation. However, parity 1 sows have the greatest average daily gain in each period of gestation. Looking at the feed efficiency for these sows, we see that parity 1 sows have the, the greatest feed efficiency in comparison to parity 2 and 3 plus sows, regardless of stage of gestation. From day 5 to 39, regardless of parity group, um, they all have the poorest feed efficiency in comparison to the other periods of gestation. 
Back fat on the y-axis here in millimeters, I have parity 1 sows, parity 2, and parity 3 plus. Um, the purple bars represent initial back fat at day 5 of gestation, and the black indicates final at day 112 of gestation. And we see if we look at parity 1 sows, they really don't gain any back fat throughout the course of gestation. However, parity 2 sows, they go from 14.3 to 15.6, so they're gaining about 1.5 millimeters. With parity 3 sows, our three plus sows, they gain about a half a millimeter throughout the course of gestation. Looking at total born on the y axis, parity one, two, and three plus sows. Parity one sows total born is 14.8, uh, parity two is 14.2, and parity three plus sows have the greatest total born at 15.5. So, our conclusions from a whole body standpoint so, we see that feed intake is variable throughout the course of gestation, regardless of parity group with females not necessarily consuming their full amount of feed. Body weight gain was greatest for parity 1 sows, followed by parity 2 and 3 plus sows. Parity 1 sows had the greatest average daily gain in comparison to parity 2 and 3 plus sows in each period of gestation. Regardless of parity group, feed efficiency was poorest from day 5 to 39, compared with sequential periods of gestation. And parity 1 sow feed efficiency was greater than parity 2 and 3 plus sows for all periods of gestation. Parity 2 and 3 plus sows gained back fat throughout the course of gestation, but parity 1 sows maintained back fat. So now we're going to get to the modeling portion, and I'm going to share just a few of those response variables with you guys. So this is maintenance requirement in K cows on the Y axis. Same setup as before. I still have day of gestation on the X. Parity 1 in the blue, parity 2 in the red, and parity 3 plus in the green. And so this is very similar to the body weight graph that I showed you previously. Uh, many of us know that maintenance requirements are based on body weight, so this is, will look very similar to that chart. So we see that parity 3 plus sows have the greatest maintenance requirement throughout gestation um, attributed to their, greater, or their, their body weight being greater. And then we see that regardless, as we move through gestation, the maintenance requirements for all, all parity groups is increasing. If we look at the energy retention of conceptus in K-cows, we see that regardless of parity group, again, as we move through gestation, the energy retention of the conceptus is increasing with a, a great increase towards the end of gestation when the demands of the conceptus are the greatest. Uh, parity 3 plus sows, in this case, have the greatest energy retention of conceptus, followed by parity 2 and parity 1 sows. The energy used for maternal protein deposition, this is in K cows, we see that parity 1 sows have the greatest energy used for maternal protein deposition, followed by parity 2 sows and parity 3 plus sows. Um, as we move throughout gestation, the energy used for maternal protein deposition is decreasing as we would expect. Moving to maternal lipid deposition, so again, a similar pattern to what we just kind of saw with maternal protein deposition. Um, in this case, parity 2 sows have the greatest energy used for maternal lipid deposition, followed by parity 3 plus sows, and lastly, parity 1 sows. Um, and what we really noticed here is that from day 75 to 109 of gestation, parity 1 sows are actually in a negative energy balance, and they're pulling from those maternal reserves uh, to meet their requirements. If we put all this together um, and we do it by parity group, so this is showing the predicted energy use just for parity 1 sows. So on the y-axis, I have the energy used in kcals per day, and day of gestation again on the x. In the blue, I have the energy used for maintenance. In the yellow, I have uh, maternal lipid gain. The gray bar is maternal protein gain, and the orange is products of conceptus, which includes the fetus, placenta, and the fluids. So we see for parity 1 sows, the greatest amount of our energy being used um, that we're supplying to this diet is to meet her maintenance requirement. We can also see that maternal lipid gain is large initially during the early stages of gestation, but diminishes as we move to the later end of gestation as the products of conceptus energy use increases, as we just saw in previous slides. Similarly, if we look at parity 2 sows, a uh, majority of the energy that is being used by this animal is, again, for her maintenance requirement. There's a great deal of energy being used to meet her maternal lipid gain, um, which is, does decrease throughout gestation, but again, it's much more than what we just saw with parity 1 sows. And maternal protein gain, it does remain pretty consistent, but it is decreasing as we move through gestation um, as the products of conceptus demands are increasing. And lastly, parity 3 plus sows, again, a majority of that energy is being used to meet her maintenance requirement. Um, and then we do see a, a substantial amount still being used for maternal lipid gain, maternal protein gain, but these are decreasing as the demands for the products of conceptus are increasing, especially in late gestation. So our takeaways from the maternal body, um, sow gestation nutrient requirements are affected largely by, largely by the requirements for sow maintenance, as well as maternal protein and lipid deposition.
each of which is heavily influenced by parity and stage of gestation. These predictions indicate that parity one sows are in a negative energy balance in late pregnancy. These findings would back up current recommendations that gilts should have their feed allowance increased from day 90 of gestation and into farrowing in order to prevent them from entering into a negative energy balance. With that, I want to thank PIC and Thomas Livestock where this study was conducted.